If we approve of state programs that redistribute wealth, we must also approve of threats of violence made against peaceful individuals. Because this is how the funds are collected. On the other hand, most of us feel uncomfortable about threatening peaceful people when we imagine having to make the threats ourselves. Hello everyone and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Uh, so today we have Tomas K. coming in from the Netherlands. He is the uh, mastermind behind BitButter <laughs> YouTube channel. Awesome, <laughs> excellent uh, animated uh, uh, anarcho-capitalist YouTube channel. Um, oh, yeah, just <laughs> just background. He's a volunteer anarcho-capitalist um, and a father of one and a half year old. Um, and a, and his, his website is georgeoughttohelp.com. And he's also, he's also got a Facebook page, George Ought to Help. Uh, and you can donate to him um, through Patreon uh, and Bitcoin. So we'll include those links, all those links in the, in the description. So, uh, Tomas, thank you for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I've been. I've. I've heard about you. Uh, I mean, I've heard about you for a while now. Uh, you've had your your YouTube channel for a few years, right? Like. Yeah, it's really ancient now. I was <laughs> kind of struck the other day by how old it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not a spring chicken anymore, but but still, it's <laughs> you got a lot of good a lot of good stuff to uh, to impart. You know, a lot of great information, and you know, with animation. That just draws, you know, a whole new crowd because, you know, it's one thing when you, when you watch like a, you know, a talk at the Mises Institute of somebody, you know, Tom Woods or Stefan Kinsella or somebody like that, and they're just saying a speech, and that's one way to learn, right? But that that reaches, I think, a certain part of the population that are more intellectual, right? But some people are more visual, right? And so, you know, videos like yours, which incorporate these concepts into uh, animation, really reaches them. Um, and that's great, you know. It's just spreading the message that much farther. So, so I'm very thankful for that. So, so before we get into those um, uh, videos, can you uh, go into a little bit of your history on how you became a volunteerist or or an anarcho capitalist? You know, what what got you down this path? Sure. Um, so I was yeah, I have this ancient YouTube ch channel, and um, so I was making. I'm an atheist, uh, and I was making that. When when I set up my YouTube channel, that was primarily what I was talking about. I was making videos relating to atheology, um, and um, at a certain point, one of my subscribers uh, asked, you know, suggested that I look at this one video, um, and that was from the user. I've forgotten what his username was then. Since then, I believe he went by Fringe Elements. Um, he had a video in any case uh, called, I don't know if it was called this, but anyway, the, the central idea was that um, uh, the state is a death threat. And it was, um, it's, it talked about um, the essence of at least state uh, legis legislature um, and its fundamental connection to uh, what, what are ultimately death threats. Um, you know the, these these laws work because everyone knows on some level that if you resist enough, like if you don't comply, then the state will see you dead before leaving you alone. Um, so that was that was that was that made a, a big impression on me. I hadn't thought about it in those terms before, um, and uh, so after. You know, after watching that video, I was very curious to to learn more about it. And most of my research happened through the, the Mises.org website. Um, that was really uh, that was really an exciting few months for me, uh, especially when you know first getting into that stuff. Um, and at the same time, I was noticing that the that the uh, that the way these ideas were communicated, also that that one video that I watched, um, was very un unaccommodating. I don't even know if that's a word, but you know, what I mean, it's it's it didn't it didn't um, it was not at all seductive. 
in in a in a certain sense. Wasn't, like, uh, it wasn't gentle. <laughs> no, it wasn't gentle, and it wasn't. Um, it didn't. It didn't like. Uh, it didn't make much accommodation for 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 people who who may not be used to hearing these ideas, mm-hmm. uh, but who would nevertheless be open minded enough to consider them. Mm-hmm. And so I thought that I could do a better job. Or than, than most of what was out there of uh, of putting a similar argument, which and I, I think the argument in George Ought to Help is is closely related to uh, to the one I saw in that video, um, and so that's what I I started I started to put that together in the evenings, uh, learning After Effects uh, during the you know through the process, and posted that and so so since then my focus changed from atheism to the volunteerism and uh, and everything connected to it. Any any uh, books or or podcasts that specifically uh, influenced you? Yeah. Um, so uh, books that were that were a big deal to me were uh, the machinery of the, uh, the machinery of freedom uh, by David Friedman, uh, which is now available. At least the, one of the previous. Uh, editions is now available for free uh, as a PDF, which is fantastic. Um, what else? There were so many. Um, uh, I think uh, more recently, um, uh, Michael Humer's book, uh, "The Problem of Political Authority." I think that that one's right. Right now, that that that's the one I recommend to people who. To people who I think have enough patience to actually read a book about it, mm-hmm. uh, and who want to know more, um, I think that right now that's that kind of in my mind that that does the job that Machinery of Freedom does, but a little bit better or a little bit more thoroughly. Um, so it's a, it's a shame that book is so expensive, uh, relatively. Um, but yeah, that that was that was really important one too. Yeah, I um, yeah for me my. Uh my transformation was catalyzed by um, the the creature from Jekyll Island, um, and then and then also um, um, Murray, Murray Rothbard. Um, you know, a few of the stuff online they're from Mises dot org also, um, which is uh, the case for the hundred percent gold dollar, I think, and um, anatomy of the state. And what has government done yeah. to our money? Those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, really, really powerful short um, books. Uh, mm-hmm. But very powerful, and uh, it's just amazing when when you read something that, cause like you said, you know, it's like this: the state surrounds us, right? You know, laws and taxes and regulations, and you know, it all surrounds us, right? But we don't necessarily. It's like I guess it's like um, you know, it's like you're you're living in a in a fenced in area. But you never actually look up close at the fence, and you you don't look at the barbed wires, you don't look at the electric electricity that's running through it. You're just living there, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you yeah. don't, you don't yeah, necessarily yeah. feel confined, right? Until somebody mm-hmm. says, you know what? Those things are electrified and that's sharp. And if you try to escape, somebody's going to shoot you. Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and everyone actually, uh, and everyone kind of knows that. Like, like, they have all the information they need to, to see that that's true. It's not like you don't have to test it. Mm-hmm. Like if you if you just seriously think it through, then you, 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 you see that it's true. Mm-hmm. They won't leave you alone. They, they they couldn't. It wouldn't. I mean, the system wouldn't work if they did. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's really powerful stuff. I think. Yeah. So the way I forget who said it, but uh, a powerful quote that stayed with me is: there there are people who who um, just want to be left alone, and people who won't leave you alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Because the people who are attracted to political power um are usually not the type of people that are like creative and ingenious and imaginative right entrepreneurs they're the people that want to add value to society and you know create jobs and just improve the standard of living right create wealth mm-hmm. <laughs> those people don't yeah. want to control other people they don't want to control their neighbor or their the town or the state you know mm-hmm. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and uh yeah i guess i guess the it's kind of, and, and once you've once you've kind of been introduced to the, these ideas, then uh, it's like so much of the. It strikes you how 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 much of the like the opposition to them, like uh, like discursively, is is really is really weak. I think um, that it uh, that like there's certain 
uh, I think uh, this, this, uh, if if you're a statist, if if you if you if you believe in the necessity or the you know the good the essential goodness of the state, then I think at least you have to, uh, in order to argue for that convincingly, you at least have to acknowledge that the state does make maintain threats of violence against peaceful people. I think you can't. Like if if you're not willing to bite that bullet, then you, you you know you you don't have a leg to stand on. I think, <laughs> and there are very few people willing to willing to admit that. I think that's 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 really interesting. Yeah, in, thing. In, in, interestingly enough, I was uh, I was see some of the the minarchists and um, like um, the nihilists also that that say um, that you know the. You know, you say you anarchists don't think the social contract is binding, right? Because you didn't sign it. Well, I didn't sign the I didn't sign the non-aggression principle. So why do I have to follow the, the non-aggression principle? It's violence. That's violence too. I'm like, wait, what? Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> it's such a weird way to look at it. You know, it's like it's like yeah. I, I should be able to kill somebody without repercussions. Okay, I don't I don't have to adhere to the non-aggression principle. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess in a way, like I mean, if uh, if if someone if someone wants to say that and that, that, you know, it's it's fair enough, and the conversation's over. I guess. Like, um, for me, like the um, like, it's it's all to do with uh, like to to persuade a person of of the the validity of these ideas uh, means appealing to their um, like to the to some of their foundational moral beliefs to begin with. Like, it's you know, if if you really think this and this and this is wrong, then you should also think this is wrong this is you know this is just an example of this stuff um if a person doesn't believe there's anything you know if, if, if they don't have this kind of uh like um visceral disgust at the idea of violence against someone who's not aggressing against you like if 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 that's no problem for them then this is just a person who's it is it, not it's not a person who you're gonna discuss this with anyway so it's like uh Okay, <laughs> we're just gonna ostracize you and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. try and defend ourselves against you. It's, yeah, it's like you're, that. You're like uh, you're you're a good candidate for a padded room, right, with a straight jacket. <laughs> right. Or, yeah. It's like um, yeah. It's 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 an interesting idea that you know um, a, a person who doesn't share your like there's there's like insufficient overlap in in your like foundational moral beliefs, and they somehow want you to want to persuade them about something and i i i, I think it's uh you know i I don't, I don't think dialogue is always necessary or possible actually mm -hmm. it's it is possible that people are so different in in what they believe is okay that uh that, that you know there's uh that whole process of reasoning is uh is, is not going to go anywhere but i think those people are quite rare i think actual like real sociopaths uh or you know People, people who really have no, um, who, who don't intuitively feel that you know violence against people is is wrong. I think those people are quite rare, fortunately. Yeah, fortunately, exactly. And and the problem is that you know, <laughs> the uh, the contradiction is that you know when people say, well, it's because people are can be evil and can be you know uh, thieving and can be you know. Um, dishonest that's why we need government I'm like wait a minute but <laughs> where, where do you think the criminals are going to go who want to control other people i mean you seriously think they're not going to want to go into into an institution that concentrates that evil even more like <laughs> right I right think. and and also you know because you know because thieving's bad you want to create an institution that you know operates off theft essentially you know that's also kind of a weird idea mm -hmm. yeah but uh, <laughs> this is really kind of preaching to the choir now, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, actually, I'm curious also as to like when you talk to people, like how do you introduce this stuff? How do you start? How do you get people to start thinking about it? Like when, when you're, you know, in your everyday life, uh, or, do you, or do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> they ask me what I do, and I say I make anti-political propaganda videos. <laughs> and they say, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, yeah, you can, and I say you can Google George Ott to help, and that that's that's why I, I I'm not um I guess I'm not an evangelist in uh you know like it's I I'm not like you know government is you know <laughs> screwing you over or uh, <laughs> I don't I, because I don't think it works. Um, you sure so, you, you sure you're not those guy that that guy in the in the subway you know with the Bible shouting at the people passing? <laughs> you're not that guy, right? <laughs> no, it's, I'm, I'm not cut out for it. 
<laughs> I think you need a special glint in your eye to be able to pull that off. Yeah, and a strong voice. I was gonna say. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I'm very soft-spoken. Uh, so, yeah, but uh, have, having having made that video and having it be, uh, you know, and having the like the follow-up to that become like a big part of my life now, that kind of has enabled me to introduce this stuff where it otherwise wouldn't have felt appropriate because it is what I do now. So it's kind of, I can legitimately say that and uh, and then people will say, oh, I'll check it out. And sometimes they do. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm really glad that I, I found it. So so can you, and you just, just uh, explain, I think you made three, three different videos, right? So George ought to help and then uh, you can leave, I think, is it called? Yeah, there's there, there's three in that is in that kind of world or in that series. There's George Ought to Help. There's Edgar the Exploiter, which is about the minimum wage, yeah. and there's You Can Always Leave, which is really the sequel to George Ought to Help. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you can you go into them and and what they're about? Because I think yeah, really yeah, awesome. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so George Ought to Help is a uh, is an examination of the. Uh, uh, of the idea of the the welfare state and how uh, how that operates on a fundamental level, um, and it invites the viewer to uh, to examine whether that fits whether whether it accords with their intuitions about the the legitimacy of of, of threats of violence. So, of course, you know uh, the welfare state operates through uh, taxation. Uh, taxation is collected through, uh, you know, it's 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 possible to collect taxation because there it's kind of undergirded by these threats of violence, which people know on some level are there if they if you know they can't just choose they can't opt not to pay. Um, so it kind of uh, it kind of steps through a bunch of scenarios. The first one is uh, you're, the viewer is asked to consider whether they would be comfortable. Uh, kind of issuing a threat against a friend of theirs, like a, a direct interpersonal threat, like uh, you know, there's, there's this there's this uh, good cause that appears. Uh, you feel strongly that this good cause should be supported. Uh, your friend doesn't want to support it. They don't give reasons. Um, would it be okay to threaten, you know, to beat them up if they, you know, to try and get them to donate? And of course, I hope that most people would kind of recoil at that suggestion and of, you know of course that's not okay um and then the scenario is modified so it becomes a uh, more and more like a like a the situation under representative democracy uh where you know you have a, a group of voters who are deciding you know the course of action to take um but the the threats are still there they're just institutionalized um and so yeah you have, you have you have these two extremes and you know you have a couple of stages in between in which the, kind of the situation morphs towards resembling the final one a little bit more and uh, and the question I ask to people who post critical comments mostly um, is in which of those situations does it become okay to threaten violence against your friend uh, you know at what, at what point does the things do, does it do, is, is there like at what point is there an ethically relevant difference that happens? Um, and so far, I, I haven't received any kind of uh, adequate answer to that. Uh, so that's that's what that's what that's that video is about. And that's how I that's how I think it works, at least. Um, and after that, I made. Well, 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 before sorry, you go into the next one, I just want to sure. I just want to comment something that came to mind is um, when George refu George is the one that refuses to help, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So George, when George refuses to help, what came to mind is like, um, in a voluntary society, right, or volunteerism, um, it, the the freedom is also uh, well, freedom also encompasses the freedom to be racist, bigoted, sexist, <laughs> discriminatory, basically, right? So yeah. So so George might not have wanted to help the guy who's who needs help for any reason, you know, because he's a guy or because he's gay or because he's black or he's Mexican, right? So it could be for any reason. And that's, I think that's another thing that, uh, that really, uh, gets under people's skin. <laughs> when, yeah, when, people when, really when, we, like when we say the, say again, 
People really don't like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah. When you say that, what is wrong with a racist? You know, as long as he doesn't hurt anybody, of course, right? It's just a, a belief, right? I mean, it may be a very damaging belief to him and his society and his peers, but again, it's just a belief, and he's not hurting anybody with that belief. <laughs> yeah, I, I've on on the sub. I mean, racism is a big thing, um, and a touchy thing, of course. Um, but I, I think it's uh, like it's really badly used term like it's it's really most of the time it's really not clear to me exactly what people mean when they when they use the term yeah yeah um races exist in the sense that they're you know you you can you can identify these categories and you can make predictions about those groups that hold true like they differ in certain ways um so you could and and from that you can create a hype, you know you can create all kinds of hypothetical situations in which the rational thing to do would be to discriminate on the basis of race like say you say you know you're in such and such a situation you're evaluating this person but you only know their race like there's nothing mm. nothing else you know about them mm-hmm. um you know do you do you choose this guy or or that one to 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 do this particular thing uh and yeah, then it makes sense to discriminate according to race. Mm-hmm. And if that's, so, you know, maybe that's racist. Um, and if it is, then then at least in hypothetical situations, we, we should be racist. So it's like, a, <laughs> and of course the, the word racist is used, it's, I mean, it's a really damning term. So sure, it's, sure. it kind of, it doesn't, there's a, there's a mismatch there. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah, I think I think we need to we. <laughs> I'm using the I'm using the the statist we. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we need to uh, think more carefully about what that word means. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is um is I, I, like I have a book by Walter Block. I haven't read it yet, but <laughs> it's on discrimination, and he's mm-hmm. I, I've seen him speak a lot about it, and um and basically you know we discriminate every day all the time right it is impossible not to discriminate when you make a choice for something or to do something you're excluding other choices you are discriminating right (laughs) i saw i saw a little little speech by walter williams when he was asked about this about racism and discrimination and and he's basically said i discriminated when i married my wife I preferred her over other women, right? I was discriminating. And even now that we're married, I'm still discriminating her. <laughs> over, and my wife yeah. is happy that I'm discriminating her <laughs> over other women. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Like you, you have this this very peculiar situation where, where, where like, uh, you know, shopkeepers are uh, uh, legally barred from, you know, they're, they're not permitted to turn people away, uh, you know, who, who match a particular demographic. That, that, that they, for whatever reason, good or bad, don't like. They're not. They're not permitted to do that. And at the same time, people are permitted. I mean, no one thinks twice about it. Um, people discriminate according to race in their interpersonal and romantic relations all the time. Um, and this is this is perfectly okay. We 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 think. <laughs> um, and I I see no. Uh, no justification for for a difference in attitudes towards those two situations like you in in the in the one situation you have you know like a medium of exchange passing hands mm-hmm. but what's you know ethically magical about that how does you know why why would that make a difference you know mm-hmm. uh and you could argue that for instance uh like let's say let's say there's someone who's very lonely they, they you know they 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 maybe they never had a romantic or sexual partner and they approach you and they you know they, they're trying to they're trying to uh, you know uh, seduce you let's say mm-hmm. and you turn them down um because you're just not into whatever group they or groups they happen to you know fit into mm-hmm. uh there's a case for you know maybe that 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 turning them down is more damaging to them than um than than uh than being turned away from a shop that uh bakes cakes for instance mm, yeah and yet uh you know there's, there's this there's this weird double standard i don't understand it i don't see any justification for it yeah because if you're obligated to do something because you know you think someone else might um, you know, I don't know, do something horrible to themselves because you turned them down, then, again, you don't own yourself. You don't own your actions, right? They 
have a higher claim to your actions, right? So, so to mm-hmm. me, that violates, you know, self ownership. And and you're right. Like like if the individual can discriminate with all these things, and you know, in the dating world, and in uh, you know, in every single <laughs> interaction you make, um, why is that different with the business, right? You know, you, an individual can discriminate. So too can the business discriminate because <laughs> it's all it's just about individuals, right? Individuals um, acting in a different in a certain way, right? Yeah, and with and and like with the individual romantic sphere, at least. I think there's, there's, in general, people are okay with the idea that people can make mistakes and that people can make bad decisions. You know, they should be allowed to do that. Um, but that tolerance is not extended to the to the to situations that involve pieces of paper changing hands. Or uh, you know, that's, that's really really odd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, so okay. So can you can you go on with uh, was it um, your sure? What, you're free to leave. I forget the. <laughs> Uh, so the second one was uh, Edgar the Exploiter. That's the oh. chronologically the oh, second okay. one. Okay, okay. Um, that one was about the the minimum wage, yeah. and uh, yeah, really, was, I really enjoyed that one. That was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that illustrates um, what the minimum wage actually does to the most vulnerable uh, members of the workforce, uh, which I think still not enough people understand. Um, mm. And I think that's some of these things are quite counterintuitive. Um, and I think you know, in in a way, it's kind of low hanging fruits. Like it's a it's a very easy idea to understand. I think once it's once it's been presented to you, yeah. um, and I think it's really important that that this kind of uh, the 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 people don't stop with their emotional response to to a, a particular policy, like you know, uh, you know, fair wage for everyone, uh, and and they and they go a little bit further and and. And understand what the actual consequences of that are likely to be. So, yeah, that's that's a video that is potentially appealing to, or at least compatible with uh, the minicist uh, set of ideas. Um, and then the 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 last in oh, so oh, far. Wait, 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 let me just comment a little bit, a little bit on that one. That one. Um, yeah. So, the minimum wage is again another highly emotionally charged topic right for a lot of people especially i think on the left right socialist type people <laughs> who you know you know want they, they what they call it a living wage right <laughs> yeah. and i'm like what exactly is a living wage and you know you know you take mm-hmm. into account inflation the federal reserve currency creation you take it you know <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like and 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 then it's, it's just funny how how people think that you know you pass a law and you force businesses to pay a certain way uh, you know a certain amount that yeah, what could that, go wrong that, right? <laughs> that that violates you know you know that that kind of magic that violates the laws of economics can suddenly you know vanish and everything will be <laughs> we'll all be we won't be richer because some mm-hmm. old guy nobody ever met passed you know wrote on a piece of paper <laughs> mm-hmm. and then yeah, pointed a gun yeah. you know yeah, I think it really like it. It says a couple of things about um, about the a kind of mindset that's really prevalent. Uh, and it's like on the one hand, that the state does, ha- you know, people have the idea that the state does have these powers, which which it doesn't. You know, I mean, all it, it has a lot of power. And it has power to use use violence. Um, yeah, the idea it it uh, it can't overturn economic law, of course. Um, and the the other thing is like people people view the economy as a as a static system. So you know you can it's just like a you know it's there on on like a you know in your spreadsheet or you know you can change this bit. You know it's just this bit that's wrong. So you change that and <laughs> you know everything everything's okay then. And uh, and of course it's it's nothing like that. And uh, everything responds to everything else somewhere and somewhere or another. I guess I guess uh, you just uh, you just remind me of something when you said that that uh, maybe some people view the economy as a as a program and you know the the government is the programmer. <laughs> yeah. And there are certain bugs that happen and then they have to come mm-hmm. in and they have to fix the bugs. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like um yeah, but it's when you you know when, once you once you've seen the the mistake in that in that thinking it's difficult to or it's difficult I guess for me to to then put myself in the shoes of people who haven't seen it again, I suppose. Like, uh, of course, the em- the the employer is going to think twice about how he can arrange his business. Like, where <laughs> where can he save costs? You know, who's right. who's now costing more than they're bringing in? 
Right, right, right. And and not only that, but all the all the different factors of competition, like, you know, you have workers competing with each other and then you have the employers competing with each other and then the, the relationship between the employer and the employee. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, the not not only the, the employers competing with each other in the same field and then maybe they're competing with other fields unrelated where people could be spending their money but they're not because they're buying from him, right? Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. And this so the, the um there was uh, if you, if you Google the uh, the uh, the indispensable janitor fallacy, mm-hmm. uh, a guy called John Colt uh, um, has addressed one of the common uh, complaints made about the Edgar the Exploiter video. Um, and if I, I hope I can summarize it correctly, so the the idea is um, like what a lot of people said in the comments as well is like um, so in in the story uh, there's this. Edgar is this kind of evil capitalist uh, stereotype who has a factory. Um, Simon is a works there sweeping the floor, um, and so when the when the minimum wage is introduced, you know Simon's uh, estimated marginal rev- revenue product is lower than the wage he would legally be required to be paid. So Edgar fires Simon, um, and the uh, objection a lot of people made was. Um, you can't run a factory without someone cleaning it you know it's like you know you the the, the janitor is indispensable you know you can't it, mm-hmm. the, you know the, the the rubbish would heap up you would have just you know i don't know exactly what they imagine but you know <laughs> things things would go to go to hell without yeah. someone sweeping the floor <laughs> and um and i think what it what it what it what it misses out is that again it's like this example of the static static systems thinking like uh people imagine that edgar has this structure of production and he, all he can do is knock out Simon. You know that's his option. Like he can have Simon, or he can knock him out. He can get rid of him, mm-hmm. and the rest of it is kind of fixed. <laughs> and of course, that's not the way it works. Um, Ed, Edgar is a kind of uh, you know he's he's a he's a reasoning human with with like all the options available to available uh, available to him mm-hmm. as his Simon resources uh, allows for, and. He could he could do one of any any number of things. Um, he could rearrange his structure of production. He could mechanize more. Uh, all the way to he could choose to close down all all operations and live off whatever he's managed to earn. Mm-hmm. Um, so pe- people are kind of stuck in this idea that you know he has a factory. How's the factory going to run? You know, <laughs> un- under this very particular set of uh, assumptions. Yeah. So that, that's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, they just take something like a, a specific. I guess is that cherry picking. <laughs> they just take a specific detail and then just delete it, and then like, well, and nah, I wouldn't worry, it'd collapse. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like yeah, you said, a- like you said, like like in a program, the difference is that the the different bits in a program are not um, reasoning and don't have critical analysis capabilities and you know don't have logic whereas people in the economy are thinking individuals human beings make their making their own choices constantly right billions of choices made every day and which is which is again another reason why it is impossible for any leader or president or prime minister or anybody who tries to direct you know these billions of interactions anything he does will cause damage r- ripple mm-hmm. down repercussions right yeah, yeah, of course, of course, um, and I think people are uh, people. People don't like the the messiness of of decentralization. Like they, I think they, because they, like in in I think in decentralized systems are. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if I'm using that word completely correctly. In systems where there's uh, where there is all this highly local uh, implicit knowledge that people are relying on all the time. Uh, mistakes are being made all the time, all across the economy, uh, and I think that idea, people don't like that idea. I I believe, um, and it's so it's kind of there's there's something seductive about the idea of central planners who can you know just get it right for everyone, and, and you know just and av- avoid all those all all that redundancy, you know all those messy all those messy mistakes, and I think people don't yet appreciate in general. Um, how important those mistakes are like that's 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 part of that's a crucial part of the process and they need to be happening all over the economy all the time yeah statism is like uh i forget who said it it's like it it it, re- it keeps the people in a perpetual state of infancy <laughs> mm. <laughs> where they don't 
they don't look to solve their own problems, but rather they look to their rulers to solve it for them, right? They, they, yeah. uh, and, and also another way I, I was just thinking about it, perhaps it's like it's like the human body, and in the mistakes that you said, it's like in the human body, how many times do cells, you know, mutate and maybe form spontaneous cancers, but you never see them because they automatically are destroyed, resorbed, and disposed of by your immune system. And so, and, and eventually those kinds of things make you stronger, right? <laughs> so I think yeah, perhaps yeah. in a similar way. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's really, uh, maybe it's overlooked that there's like, there's an aspect of, uh, appreciating markets, which is aesthetic. Like you have to, you can you kind of have to have a taste for the way that works. It has to kind of appeal to you. Uh, yeah, I think in, on the level of aesthetics, like, um, I think that maybe that's not talked about enough. Like I, I, I like it that there are that, that there are all these mistakes being made everywhere. That um, that there's a lot of redundancy, and that the result is, if it's left to itself, very robust, and that you don't have these catastrophic failures that sweep through the whole thing. I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, just to just to pick up on one thing you said, um, I found myself. Um, being more careful about using the word uh, uh, infantilize um, because I don't think, yeah, since having, since having a kid, I don't think it's necessarily the case that kids do look for their, look to their parents to do everything for them. Um, uh, depending on how you, <laughs> depending on how you, how you, how you parent, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, or at least that's what I would hope at least. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <That's laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, so I, um, you know, I really try to treat them as a, as an equal, <clears throat> right? The, the whole idea about peaceful parenting and about, um, you know, raising your kid and respecting them as a person, as an individual, right? That they have their own right to their own body, self-ownership, all the rights that you have. And so, therefore, that would, you know, preclude things like corporal punishment and spanking and, and even public school, you know, so many things that you would, that, you, that, you know, most parents don't think twice about asking consent for <clears throat> yeah. and circumcision. <laughs> and, and they just do because most of the time because everybody else does it, right? It's the appeal to uh, popularity or, or it's been done, you know, for so many mm. years. So, why would I not do it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one one other one other thing I, I thought was a like it's, I think is an interesting tangent. Um, so you you talked about the like the analogy with a with a program uh, mm -hmm. like the, the economy versus a computer program something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are uh, there are a very limited number of video games that um, that do a that do a decent decent job of. Uh, of making the case for uh, for freedom, for uh, um, or decentralization, or uh, and I think that has something to do with the way that um, um, yeah, that, that that kind of model. Like if you um, uh, you have a lot of SimCity ish mm. things, like in, in which in which you're the, you're the controller, you're 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 arranging these things, and that's you know that's what makes it interesting to. To, to join in with that process, like you have that power. Mm. Um, SimCity isn't interesting if everyone just does their thing without without needing you, um, and and it works fine, and it, and even it works better than if you do get involved. Um, and I guess the I guess the most interesting ones are the uh, are the video games that like the massively multiplayer ones where you're kind of essentially they they outsource their interestingness to actual humans who 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 are making. Uh, genuine decisions uh, with very local knowledge, intrinsic knowledge, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about lately. I, I'm, uh, I'm involved in making a video game, and um, so it's it's kind of in the in the back of my mind how, how and if even uh, video games could be a medium that can be used to kind of, uh, to propagandize, essentially. And I don't think... Pro Propaganda is a is a dirty word. I'm I'm quite comfortable to use it. Yeah, I was actually wondering when when you said you described your uh, what you do as anti political propaganda. What why why do you choose to use the word propaganda? Because that does have a negative connotation. Yeah. Um. I guess. Um. 
I guess it, there's a number of levels to it. On, on the one on the one hand, it's kind of I suppose it's kind of sensational. Like people are used to that connotation. Um, I suppose people are not used to people, uh, you know, saying that's what I do. That's just what I do. Um, on the other hand, the like propaganda means um, met- uh, media designed to influence opinion, which is mm-hmm. unquestionably what I'm doing. Uh, it's it's kind of connotation like the the negative connotation it has it kind of adds to that uh you know through deception <laughs> or through dishonesty yeah, uh, yeah, and of yeah. course i don't think that's what i'm doing uh but the core of what propaganda is i believe that's definitely what i'm doing and it is a separate uh form of expression like it's this it's distinct from from other stuff that's out there i think it's a it's important to to acknowledge that that's a category it belongs to <laughs> Yeah, that's really the first time I heard of somebody, um, I mean, especially an anarcho-capitalist, refer to their own work as propaganda. <laughs> and I will reconsider the definition of that word now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so you, you, you've influenced me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, and, and, and what about the, the last video in your, in your series that you've done so far? Yeah, so uh, the last in that series is uh, You Can Always Leave. And it's the longest of the three. Um, and it's uh, like the script of that video is is based often kind of taken like verbatim uh, from comments that were made in response to George Ott to help. So the form of you can always leave is two characters like a you can imagine like a perhaps a statist and a voluntarist, uh, and they're and they're having a discussion about George Ott to help. So it's kind of they're watching it on a TV screen mm-hmm. and they have a have a conversation about it afterwards. And that kind of that conversation is also illustrated with you know kind of sequences of the kind of visualize the the the, the hypothetical situations they're considering. Um, so like the the skeleton character, the one that I did the voice for, is the is the statist. I thought that was appropriate that I should <laughs> take that part. Uh, I was uh, a, a big thing in my mind was that I I didn't want to I didn't want a straw man. Um, what the what the critics of the video had been saying, mm. um, and I I, I, so I came across that expression recently. Uh, Iron Iron Man. I wanted to Iron Man their criticisms. So I wanted to make them as you know modify them to make as, them as strong as possible in in my mind at least. Mm-hmm. So I kind of you know I took out all the name calling and all the the invective, <laughs> and uh, and I like I took what I thought were the best bits. Um, and I had the skeleton character make those objections in a very civil, reasonable way. Uh, I thought, and and then the the lion character or the yellow character uh, responds to those in a way that I think, uh, well, in in a way that I might, if I was kind of especially, uh, you know, on it, <laughs> and I could get the words out in the right order. So um, yeah, so it's, I believe it it kind of addresses. The most, the most commonly made and the most weighty criticisms, and they kind of fall into two groups. Those criticisms, um, like the first ones, are essentially saying, uh, you know, George ought to help is misleading because um, the state doesn't threaten violence against people. You know, all all they all you get is a fine, etc. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so, of course, the 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 lion takes the skeleton character through this kind of chain of events that happen. Um, and, you know, like this essentially a, like a series of increasingly severe punishments that ends with, um, you know, being shot uh, if you if you resist strongly enough. Um, so, yeah, it's like taxation is certainly enabled by this ultimate threat of deadly force. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then the, the second objection was, the uh, yeah, the idea of the social contract that this arrangement you know there are threats of violence fair enough but you've consented to them somehow because of this this idea and um, so I think you know so I I, I I I briefly talked about that idea you know I didn't sign anything that kind of idea um, and I, I don't think that's a very strong objection to the to, to the uh, to the idea of the social contract because you you know you do have examples of 
agreements which don't require a signature, like you know, restaurants, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the much stronger objection is that um, the state has no it, it is not in a position to extend that offer to you to begin with. Like it has no legitimate claim to the land you're living on, the stuff you're using. So, you know, it it can say, you know, these and you know, you can use this stuff and these these are the conditions. But uh that that's in my in my mind at least, and I think in the minds of probably most voluntarists, that's not it's not binding because the state is not it has no right to do that in the first place. So even if you would, even if you would kind of agree, you know, if, even if you would say, you know, okay, then uh, you're doing so under duress, um, and it's an entity that has no, no no right to to make that demand from you in the first place. So it's yeah, that's that's what I believe at least. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here. So uh, <laughs> um, so the first thing I'll say is uh, I I've you know, when talking about this topic about, you know, you can always leave or, you know, it's a social contract. The first thing is, um, well, you accepted it because once you came of age, I guess, what, 21 years old, you could have left and gone to another country, right? But since you chose to stay, therefore you are um, accepting of the terms of living here. It's like, they say, it's like living in a condo complex, you know, you have to pay your dues, and then you get services as a result, yeah. right? So it's no different with the state. You pay your dues and you get services. So why are you complaining? <laughs> yeah. What would you say? Like, the, the, the difference is that uh, the state doesn't own the land that, that you live on. Uh, so it's, you know, it doesn't, doesn't get to even legitimately offer you those terms. Like it's, it, has no, uh, it has nothing to bargain with legitimately, I think. So uh, you, know, you can say that. You, know, you can say uh, you, cho- you choose to stay, blah, blah, blah. But... Uh, now, if unless you can show that the state does own the land, and not many people try it and do that even, uh, then it's kind of this, this is this is this is all just hot air essentially. Yeah, and then and then uh, so I would say something like that, and then they would and then the person would tell me, um, "All right, so even if the state doesn't own the land, try try not paying your taxes and staying. <laughs> What's going to happen to you? And then just tell the state you don't own the land." <laughs> And and then yeah, so. you're gonna you're gonna get into trouble for sure. Yeah. This is this isn't you know this is like everyone knows this. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, so, isn't, this isn't an attempt at persuasion even, right? It's so, just like a this is actually actually a threat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um and so and so to to this person it seems to me that mo- morality has no bearing on their life, like. They just live so that they don't die. Basically, <laughs> it's like it doesn't. They don't. They don't think of the world in terms of morals, right? Because they think of the world. I'm paying my taxes so I don't die or get in prison. Um, but I'm like, or or I, I guess we were talking about you know not nihilists or you know or sociopaths. They don't kill people, um, not because they know they think it's immoral, but because they might die in the process. <laughs> the only reason why they wouldn't, right? right? Yeah, I I think uh, in in my mind, um, most people who would make arguments like that, yeah, I mean, I guess nihilists can, can be among them, but it's also the case that people make arguments like that when they um, when they do have moral convictions, but they're insufficiently interested in having a coherent set of moral uh, ideas. Mm-hmm. I think that can happen too. Uh, I, I guess I should say I'm I'm a moral nihilist in the sense that I don't believe there are uh, I, um, I don't believe that moral facts exist in the sense of mind independent aspects of the universe. Um, but I do notice that I have very strong moral intuitions, and these are very important to me. Uh, and it's also important to me that these moral intuitions cohere with each other. I, I'm, I'm, I can't, I, I won't tolerate, uh, like, a uh, contradictions there. So, yeah, I think it can go, it can go different ways. Like, ni- and nihilism doesn't necessarily, or moral nihilism doesn't necessarily mean, um, anything's okay if you can get away with it, which, okay. which a lot of people do think. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty curious now because um yeah, the way I understood nihilism anyway is is in that sense like subjective morality like, you know, I don't believe in good or bad or 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 good or immoral or moral. I just think whatever is expedient to me and that doesn't cause me harm now. 
mm-hmm. um, and so because usually um, I I tend to talk about um, objective morality in the sense that it's universalizable in the same sense that so the the laws of economics cannot be violated without repercussions consequences right <clears throat> um, mm-hmm. and same thing with you know laws of uh, you know, mathematics, of a planetary motion, of physics, you know, same thing with laws of economics, right? Cannot be violated without, without incurring consequences. Same thing with the laws of morality. They are universalizable. They're not, rec- they're not dependent on, um, you know, laws and political scribbles uh, because if you kill somebody, there will be moral consequences, <laughs> there will be inherent consequences from the family members or people who saw you do it or whatever, you know? So it, it's not necessary for a law to exist for it to have consequences. So in that sense, to me anyway, I look at that as being um, uh, universal or, uh, you know, objective morality. <laughs> mm. to, uh, to, I, I guess I guess I would disagree. To me, that's st- that, that sounds still like a, a- uh, like a pragmatic um, an appeal to pragmatism like uh, uh, because it, it it doesn't catch the catch the occasion that you you know this uh, you know absurd hypothetical again really unpopular person no family has wronged you somehow you could get away with killing them yeah you you that this would you know uh, this would be expedient for you for some reason you know maybe they would not interfere with some plan you have mm-hmm. Um, if, 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 like, uh, you know, in this hypothetical, if you could be guaranteed somehow that, that you would, then no one would ever know. Uh, and, you know, maybe that's already, maybe that makes the hypothetical already sufficiently removed from reality that it's not applicable. That's, that's, I'm open to that, uh, rebuttal. <laughs> um, but for me, it's, it's not, uh, it's not really satisfying. Um, the, the, to, to me, uh, I, I, I would, you know, in in that situation, as someone who doesn't believe in moral facts, I would, I uh, I would certainly not kill this person, uh, unless they were you know trying to uh, do the same to me, mm-hmm. um, because, um, it's really really important to me to uh, for my moral beliefs and actions to to cohere, and you know it kind of sounds it sounds very dry, but that you know if I if I say it in those terms, but um, you, mean, you mean wooden. <laughs> I'm sorry. You mean, you mean it sounds wooden, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It sounds very cold. Um, but but uh, I I mean this is this is the language I use to to describe what's what's a what's a really uh, visceral uh, response. Like it's n- not okay. Like it, I I feel that in the you know if you can say that in the core of my being or in my heart or whatever mm-hmm. metaphor you choose. Mm-hmm. Like I feel that very very strongly. Um, and at the same time, I don't believe that feeling has anything to do with moral facts. I believe that feeling is very probably a product of, of evolution, um, and I'm still not going to do it. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because mm. for me, it's so important not to mess that up. You know, not to it, that, that moral cohesion is so important for me that I'm that I'm still not going to do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. That makes sense to me, and and so I'm I'm kind of um, you know I guess I I want you to I, well I I want to hear an elaboration because when you say that you're a moral nihilist and then you describe yourself as a person that would not um, you know aggress against somebody even if you could get away with it and you know no consequences would have you wouldn't do it because it would be morally repugnant to you. Yeah. So in what way are you a moral nihilist? Then <laughs> is what I'm wondering. Well, yeah. So um, I think. Uh, at least in my understanding of, of the term, uh, moral realists believe that there is such, such a thing as a uh, as a moral fact. Like there is such a thing as a as a mm-hmm. as a mind independent ought. You know, mm-hmm. like a, with a capital O. Mm-hmm. Like you you ought not do blah blah blah. You know, even if evolutionary history was different, maybe, or even if uh, you could get away with it, etc. You know, in, in any situation, it would not be okay because it's somehow. And then, I, and this is me filling in uh, a little bit now, but, but it's somehow part of the cosmos, you know, that it's mm-hmm. it's just it's just wrong, mm-hmm. like uh, with a capital W. <laughs> um, and and for, for for me, that's not the case. I don't believe facts like that exist. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe I've kind of inherited a bunch of wiring, or uh, you know, uh, that kind of stuff um, that makes me feel certain ways in certain situations, and some of those feelings are very very strong. Um, 
and I prefer for those from for those action, the actions and beliefs related to those fear, feelings to cohere with one another, um, and like the the, uh, the feeling of guilt is a very strong feeling that I that I want nothing to do with. I don't want. I just, I just don't want that. Mm. Um, so moral nihilism is a philosophical uh, stance. Um, certainly doesn't mean uh, that the person would be a dangerous or shifty or you know other, otherwise unpleasant to person to to be around or to deal with. But of course, I would say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I think um, I don't know a, ver- a very a very kind of a very naive uh, moral nihilism might say you know if you can get away with it, do it. Um, yeah. But I think that's that's kind of, I think that's pretty short-sighted. Like most people just feel bad doing stuff that they, you know, stuff that they find morally repugnant. Mm-hmm. And I think most people do find it morally repugnant to attack someone, you know, who, who's who's not in the process of attacking them. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to yeah, elaborate a little bit on that because, uh, I mean, I mean, I. I, I mean, I guess, I guess the the only thing, the only thing that's important, you know, we can, we like, we talk about these things with people online and everything, and you know about, you know, um, the universality of morality and things like that. But I guess it all comes down to, you know, <laughs> would you use violence to get what you want, right? right. And that's what it comes down to, right? And yeah. if you wouldn't, then you're essentially a peaceful individual, <laughs> I guess, yeah, regardless yeah. of the uh, semantics and the terminology that, <laughs> that we call each other, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would, I would much prefer to live in a community of uh, voluntarist Catholics, for instance, than atheist statists, for sure. Uh, <laughs> exactly. if, even, if, you know, even if they believe uh, that it's primarily a threat of punishment by the universe, uh, you know, the creator of the universe, which is keeping them from doing bad things to me you know, I, I don't really mind <laughs> yeah yeah for a long time i thought that was a uh, a contradiction you know a, a christian voluntarist you know because it's all about like there's no you know no masters no slaves no rulers right no subjects but um but i i, I interviewed a, um, a voluntarist christian and he was talking about that and and you know again like i think jesus some of the a lot of the things he said were very um you know libertarian if not if not volunteers, like, like, uh, you know, he never advocated for a welfare state, right? <laughs> Maybe, you know, he advocated for charity, but not a welfare state. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess my, for, for me, the, 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 the kind of, well, I guess, complaint or worry about religion in general, like, uh, or, you know, uh, organized religion then that, that, that I, I still find compelling and a worry is that, um, uh, the religious texts, which are found so important, um, do seem extremely malleable. Like you can, uh, they contain a lot of contradiction. Mm. So you know, as as long as these texts are being revered, um, there's room for bad stuff to happen in the future by people who are sufficiently convinced that these are the word of the creator of the universe. I'm I'm sympathetic to that argument or that worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like when I was uh, when I was growing up. In in high school, I uh, I did a lot of uh, reading into world religions. You know, I'm not religious myself, but I didn't grow up in any religion. But I studied a lot of world religions independent of my government school, and mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, I did I did kind of uh, conclude that there's you know just reading the Bible a little bit as a at, not as a as a as a factual text, <laughs> but as a literary text, <laughs> as a mm-hmm. novel, you know, <laughs> work of fiction. And uh, there's a lot of violence, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of genocide, a lot of killing, you know. And yeah. and to me, God seems to be more like a you know a jealous ex girlfriend, you know, like <laughs> snooping and just you know always envious. What are you talking? What are you saying about me? Are you yeah, are you worshiping somebody else? Like <laughs> you seeing somebody okay. else? <laughs> God is a really bad role model. Yeah. Yeah. God of the Bible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, so so I uh, I have come to realize that by far the. Uh, the uh, the religious of statism is by far much more dangerous than any yeah. kind of organized religion <laughs> has yeah. ever been. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Larkin Rose did a great job with this. I don't know if you have you read that book, the Most Dangerous Superstition. I haven't. I've heard about it a lot. Yeah. 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 He does. He does a great job with that one. So. Um, 
so yeah, so so if there's anything else that you want to, um, uh, you know, you plug your your YouTube channel, your website, any uh, anything else you want to uh, mention to the to the listeners before we sign off? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, sure, that there ought to be something, <laughs> but nothing <laughs> pops to mind. I'm afraid. So just well, just just the YouTube channel, right? And the the one that we mentioned, the the website and the the Facebook, and and any other yeah. pro- any other projects that you're working on at the moment. Uh yeah, so um, so I'm making a quite a different thing, like a, a local multiplayer racing game. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, which I'm which I'm busy with. Um, so so not cello, an, cello. not, not anarcho capitalist at all. <laughs> No, I haven't found a way to work that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. I do, I do want to do. I, I want to do something along those lines, though. I want to combine those things, but I haven't found uh, like something that seems like a viable plan yet. It seems like ev- everything I've considered seems to be too much, uh, kind of shoehorning one thing into another. Mm. But I haven't given up yet. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm still still have that in the back of my mind. Uh, apart from that, I'm working on uh, a three-part series uh, about Bitcoin um, called uh, Bitcoin for the Intelligent Layperson. Oh, you, you posted one of those, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I remember that. Okay. So the first the first part one is online right now. Um, yeah. And it's kind of, it's, uh, it's intended to be uh, a thing that kind of fills the gap between like the, 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 the most basic of the basic video primers about Bitcoin and the more hardcore technical things. It's kind of, it hopes to, I hope it lands kind of somewhere in between. So for people who aren't quite satisfied with, you know, the, 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 the usual things you hear about Bitcoin, but aren't necessarily familiar with, uh, you know, the, the language of the technology uh, surrounding cryptog- uh, cryptography. So uh, yeah, I hope that that will be useful uh, for people to learn more about it. I think it's a super important development and will continue to become more so. Yeah, yeah. I, I love talking about Bitcoin to, to some people. It's a great, um, I think that's a great introduction to maybe talking about volunteerism. Like with me, when I talk to people, I, I start usually talking about um, monetary economics. Like I don't mention, you know, anarchists. I don't mention, you know, <laughs> government is illegitimate or immoral or, you know, taxation is theft because a lot of those things can have, uh, you know, emotional responses that are not too pleasant <laughs> so so yeah monetary economics talking about money talking about central banks talking about bitcoin you know those tend to be more neutral topics and don't really enrage people <laughs> too much yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah it's true <laughs> yeah that's a good it's a good it's a good way in in that sense i suppose i like in my in my work i, I kind of like to do the contrarian thing and to to say stuff which which i wholeheartedly believe but stuff which I also know that many people are going to be like, what, what, how can you, how can you say such a thing? Like, I guess, uh, I, I guess it has that in common with uh, like uh, Walter Block's book, right? Uh, defending the, Oh, I love that book. Is that I the, love that book. Yeah. I hope I got the title right. <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> yeah. I really, I'm, I'm really attracted to that approach as well, I guess. Uh, yeah. I guess I like that. Like, I, I, I suppose I like the adversarial component of, of talking about this stuff too and maybe that's not strategically the most useful thing but uh yeah i definitely enjoy it and i learn a lot from it so you're saying you don't take the approach to make more friends you're saying right no <laughs> <laughs> and, and you say no, I, you, I have too many friends <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking for ways to lose them <laughs> you, you say that so you say the most subversive things in the in the softest, gentlest voice possible. <laughs> yeah, so, something like that, actually. <laughs> something like that. In in a, uh, it, it, you could see this stuff as a kind of filter, you know, like the people who the people who make it through this stuff and and still want to be want to associate with you somehow. They're they're okay. Like, uh, you know, they're, they're they're the good ones. They have like some tough moral skin there. So. <laughs> yeah, or they're 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 willing to to think about things a little more seriously, perhaps, or or a little more carefully, or or even just to postpone judgment, because that's that's also a rare, a rare enough thing. Yeah, like people who, people who might disagree with me quite strongly, but uh, don't write me off as a person uh, on the basis of that. <laughs> I think that's that's pretty valuable. Yeah, before you uh, explain your your you know economic analysis of why minimum wage is immoral they say you just hate poor people what yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait you didn't, let me, you didn't let me finish explaining <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah 
So I mean, in 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 my, in my non-internet life, I'm surrounded by people who are to some to some degree uh, at least implicit statists. I think you know they they believe on some in some level on the on the in the in the the goodness or necessity of the state. Um, so that's 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 maybe yeah. I think I think maybe that's. Um, that varies uh, from place to place, I guess, because I guess if you live in New Hampshire, for instance, that's that's a, that's a different thing entirely. Um, but yeah, I suppose that's also going to have an effect on on how you choose to uh, design what you want to say. Uh, I I have my friends in the back of my mind when I'm when I'm making stuff, so I suppose that I suppose that feeds into that it feeds into it somewhere. <laughs> Very nice. So 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 um all right. So you said the Bitcoin is a three part series, right? We'll yeah. All right, so maybe when you finish that, maybe we can have you back on. We can have a discussion on Bitcoin. That's a, that's would be great. That's a great topic too. I, you know, it's pretty complex and it's very interesting. I like talking about that as well. So, yeah. awesome conversation, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, very likewise. Much. Thank um, you. Be- beautiful uh, topics. I really, I really enjoyed it. So, um, so yeah. So hopefully we'll get you back on. Uh, do, you, do you know when you might get that done? Like by the end of the year or maybe longer? Uh, I don't dare say. I've learned that. <laughs> promise, promising that kind of stuff is yeah. only uh, only brings pain so okay. i'm not gonna do it <laughs> pain and does you sound like my wife that's what she says we don't make i don't like to make plans because then i just get disappointed so <laughs> we're just gonna go and do stuff that's all i'm gonna tell you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you sound exactly like her it's funny <laughs> there's a lot of wisdom to that i think <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm fine with that you know I'm, you know plan and no plan it's no problem for me so like, i'm pretty <laughs> easygoing guy so Good. Cool. <laughs> Excellent conversation, Tomas. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> so this is um, Peace Flanagism. Oh, by the way, if anybody wants to donate, um, uh, you can you can donate through PayPal uh, or Bitcoin. Um, although PayPal has, uh, you know, it's getting a little sketchy, but uh, so far that's all I got. <laughs> if you want to if you want to send gold and silver, by all means try. I don't really trust the U- USPS, but uh, you can try. <laughs> so. Uh, be my guest. Send me some value. We'll find a way to receive it. So um, <laughs> thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tomas. Uh, really appreciate it. So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the ConsciousResistance.com and the SeedsOfLiberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.